Hi, this is Kendrick with WorldMedicalSchool.org. We're going to talk about congenital heart disease, and we're going to cover the most common congenital heart diseases, but keep in mind there's a lot that we're not going to cover today. But uh, hopefully we can get a good overview of the presentation of con congenital heart disease in general. So first of all, who's responsible for finding congenital heart disease? We think about the radiologists looking at these ultrasounds in the prenatal, uh, prenatal screenings as being the first line of defense, but they're only going to pick up maybe a quarter to over half of these uh, congenital heart diseases. And uh, it depends on uh, what study you listen to, but somewhere in the middle, I'm guessing, is where, where the real number lies. And then in the hospital, uh, you may pick up another 18% of these uh, with just the routine hospital screenings. But really, it's going to be up to the primary care provider in, in maybe half of these cases or, or a little less than half uh, to identify them. Of course, um, as we'll talk about here in a second, there the degree or the severity of the disease is going to be uh, a big factor in how quickly we pick it up. But obviously, the earlier the better. So the screening tools are echo, stethoscope, history, and physical, probably in a reverse order. Uh, the history and physical is going to tell us a lot. Um, then we're going to use a stethoscope and probably pick up a lot of these murmurs. And then in the end, if we suspect something, we'll use the echo. So the risk factors, ones we often think of are phenytoin, ACE inhibitors, and lithium, alcohol, and smoking, which has a little bit weaker data, but certainly alcohol. And uh, we'll do another lecture on teratogens in the future. But these are the big ones that have to do with congenital heart defects. Any, uh, any infection that causes fever in the mother can also cause uh, congenital heart defects, but more likely it's going to be caused by the torch infections, which we also will cover at a different time. So assisted reproductive technology, as in uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, is, uh, is more likely to cause uh, or be associated with a uh, heart defect and uh, family history. What I didn't have on this list is just a mystery if you add that bullet point on your list because most of these are actually not going to be associated with any of these factors. They just kind of show up on their own. We don't know why. We're going to break it into two big categories, the acyanotic versus the cyanotic, or the pink versus the blue. So there's more in each of these categories, and the categories maybe aren't as cut and dry as we, as we like to think of them. But for the purpose of this lecture, let's think of the three Ds, uh, which is ventricular septal defect, uh, atrial septal defect, and patent ductus arteriosus. Let's think of those as the acyanotic diseases. And the reason why is because these are rarely going to present with immediate cyanosis in uh, infants. They can if they are severe enough, but almost all the time these are going to be acyanotic and often asymptomatic patients, at least to begin with. And then we have our cyanotic um, patients, and these are the ones... In most cases, they're going to have a uh, right to left shunt instead of a left or right left <laughs> right to left shunt instead of a left to right shunt, and we'll talk about more of that as we go along. But basically, these ones are cyanotic because we're pumping uh, less oxygenated blood through uh, through the arteries. So uh, the mnemonic we use here is one, two, three, four, five. One is for one trunk, that's truncus arteriosus, where uh, both the uh, aortic and the pulmonic uh, uh, pulmonary arteries are um, coming out of the same trunk. Then we have two for two-vessel switch, that's trans transposition of those great vessels. Those are certainly going to be cyanotic, and uh, we'll talk about more, that more when we get to it. Three for tri, tricuspid insufficiency. Four for tetra, tetralogy of Fallot. And five for total anomalous pulmonary venous return. 
And we're not going to go into that too much, but it does have five words, so it fits nicely into our mnemonic today. Again, these uh, these cyanotic um, diseases, I don't think that's how you spell cyanotic, by the way. Um, let's spell it with a C-Y-A-N. Anyway, these ones are, are not always going to be cyanotic right at birth, um, but they're certainly more likely to be than the acyanotic ones. Um, and there's, all of them are more likely to be symptomatic earlier on than our acyanotic diseases. So the most common, both the most common acyanotic and the most common overall uh, congenital heart disease is ventricular septal defect. And we've got another great misspelling here with associated. Um, it's associated with uh, Apert's down uh, Down syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome, the torch infections, cry to chat, uh, trisomy 13 and 18. So these, this list is actually a pretty good list of the most uh, common causes of congenital heart defect. And, and as ventricular septal defect is the most common of these, then uh, it's associated with basically all of them. So on your history and physical a lot of these kids are going to be asymptomatic. So you're going to get out of the stethoscope and you're going to hear this holosystolic murmur. Holosystolic as uh, we uh, pump in the left ventricle, we have a lot more pressure in the left ventricle than in the right. So that's where we're getting that left to right shunt. And we're pushing blood through the defect um, between the ventricular septum. So if this is a small hole, which it, it's more likely to sm be small than big, then you get kind of a harsh holosystolic murmur. And you hear it down at the left lower sternal border where you kind of envision the ventricular septum to be. If it's a bigger defect, then you might get a little bit of a palpable thrill. You get a loud S1, and you get this diastolic rumble. So if you think about um, the uh, left ventricle that is going to be uh, pushing blood not only out into the aorta but also into uh, the right ventricle, then you can you can see that there's going to be a little bit more pressure on that right side pumping into the left ventricle, um, and there's also going to be less pressure. Um, uh, relatively less pressure in uh, the left ventricle than you would normally have and that is going to um, make it so you have more blood going through the mitral valve. Sorry, long, uh, that was a long, long explanation of why you have this uh, diastolic rumble. But if that's only if it's a, a real large defect. So uh, you, the diagnosis of all of these I'm going to have uh, echo, EKG, and chest x-ray basically on all of them. So, um, but with the, with the ventricular septal defect, um, you, uh, on the uh, x-ray, you might see some uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, and you can see signs of that on the EKG as well. So, um, and that'll be kind of the most that I'll say about uh, about the diagnosis on, on uh, chest x-ray and EKG because really you're going to do an echo if you suspect it and the echo is the definitive uh, diagnos diagnostic uh, test. So to treat it um, most of the time you're going you're gonna to monitor this at first because some of these will close up over time and uh, most of them will get smaller over time. Um, and so we do do surgery on it, um, but uh, we usually hold off on the surgery unless they're real symptomatic or if, the sim um, or if it persists over a, a year. We just want to make sure that uh, we don't get heart failure um, and uh, avoid, avoid Eisenmenger syndrome which we'll talk about here in a second too. So here's a diagram of a ventricular septal defect and you can see on the diagram the hole where we're um, slipping 
um, with some of this blood from the left ventricle into the right ventricle um, and then that's pushing more of this blood up into um, the pulmonary artery. So now atrial septal defect. Um, this is associated with uh, Holt Orem and fetal alcohol syndrome, Down syndrome. Um, I didn't know much about Holt Orem. I still don't know much about uh, about it. But um, Holt Orem, remember, is uh, has the the absent uh, radii, the uh, atrial septal defect in first degree heart block, and I. I it, I thought it was kind of funny that it's Holt Orem when really it's you're missing half your arm. So you, if you remember that easier, think about half Orem uh, instead of Holt Orem and fetal alcohol syndrome and oh sorry uh, and uh, atrial septal defect and the uh, heart block. So um, on history and physical. If they're if they're symptomatic, then they're going to be fatigable, um, frequent upper respiratory symptoms, and failure to thrive. That goes for ventricular septal defect too. I just kind of left that off there. But you you're more likely to get uh, upper respiratory uh, infections, and you're less likely to thrive if you got any heart defect. So ostium premium defects present um, early, and ostium secundum defects present later on. Um, on exam, you you might get a right ventricular heave. Uh, wide fixed split S2 is the big one to remember on atrial septal defect. I don't know why that is. I should have uh, tried to figure out why you hear that. But uh, just remember wide fix split at S2 with atrial septal defect. Um, you get a systolic ejection murmur at upper left sternal border. Be sure to remember these murmurs because um, they're, they're good for, for testing. Uh, really, you're probably going to send any baby with a significant murmur to uh, cardiology if you are a primary care provider. If you are just learning cardio cardiology and you're going to be a cardiologist, I'm sure you're going to get a lot more information than this, but but try and remember these murmurs anyway, at least for testing, um, and so you can get an idea in real life when this happens. So diagnosis, again, echo, EKG, chest x-ray, not going to talk much about this. Treatment, um, like VSD, you kind of wait it out. Or you do surgery if um, they're having heart failure or if uh, the pulmonic to systemic flow is two to one. So remember if we're, if we're leaking blood into the right ventricle, you're going to get more blood flow through the pulmonic, um, the pulmonic artery. And so if that ratio is two to one, then it's time for surgery. Some of the complications you can get are arrhythmias, CHF, and Eisenmangers. Let's talk about Eisenmangers for a second. So Eisenmangers syndrome is, uh, is the point at which um, we start to get really symptomatic in a lot of these acyanotic diseases. And the reason is... To begin with, we had just a right, a left to right shunt, where we're pumping oxygenated, oxygenated blood back into the the uh, right heart and the lungs. But then what happens is we we build up that pressure um, in the lungs, and as you can see here, written in uh, uh, the uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijani language, which I don't speak, but I found this picture. Um, you can see here that the uh, blood is getting pumped out of the lungs and you're going to get pulmonary hypertension. So that pulmonary hypertension is going to back up blood into the right heart and then that shunting that we had going from left to right 
is going to reverse and start going from right to left. And what does that mean? That means less oxygenated blood that's going to get pumped right out into the aorta and into the rest of the body. So we're going to get cyanotic because um, we're pumping less oxygenated blood through the body. So the last of the acyanotic diseases, patent ductus arteriosus. You see this more often with rubella. Um, prematurity, uh, female babies are more likely to get this. And um, on history and physical, they're often asymptomatic. Um, but you might get some failure to thrive. It's associated with lower extremity clubbing, um, lower respiratory infections, and I don't know why that is compared to the upper respiratory infections that we saw with the ASD and VSD. Uh, but then you can eventually get congestive heart failure with this as well, especially if it's a big defect. Um, and we remember what that is, right? It's the... Uh, let me back up. So... We don't have a good picture of it here, but there's a there's this connection between um, here we go. There's this connection between the aorta and the pulmonary arteries um, that we call uh, ductus arteriosus, and if that stays open, then again we're going to be um, we're going to be having a shunt, and since in most cases the uh, aortic pressure is going to be much higher than the uh, pulmonic artery or pulmonary artery pressure. We're, we're mostly going to be pushing oxygenated blood back into the lungs. But again, um, this uh, this can uh, still still make it so we're not pumping blood as efficiently. So um, on this, you get a wide pulse pressure, which you can imagine because you're pumping harder. To get more, to get enough blood out, and we're draining a lot of that blood into the uh, pulmonic artery. And then on uh, exam, we hear this continuous uh, machinery murmur, and that machinery murmur, um, if you see it like that on a test, is going to be uh, probably pathognomonic for patent ductus arteriosus. But it's just you hear it all the time because there's always pressure in the aorta. Remember the aorta is a little bit stretchy um, and as you push blood into it um, it's it's squeezing down afterwards and going to be pushing blood through that patent ductus arteriosus. You're most likely to hear it at the second left intercostal space um, which is the area of course um, where we listen um, for the pulmonic artery. You hear a loud S2, and you have bounding peripheral pulses. And uh, the diagnosis um, is done, uh, again, Doppler, EKG, and chest x-ray. Um, to treat it, we use indomethacin to, to close it up. Um, so indomethacin, remember, is, uh, is an NSAID. And the reason why that works you can understand more if we talk about how we keep it open because it's it's maintained with prostaglandins and remember uh, NSAIDs prevent the production of prostaglandins so we we want to uh, we want to keep of course close it up if um, if it's uh, not closing immediately but um, if you have some other anomaly like transposition of great vessels which is completely incompatible with life then you want to keep it open so we can um, have some shunting of the um, oxygenated blood into um, into the aorta which um, if if you do have transposition of great vessels, then otherwise you're not getting uh, the oxygenated blood out into the body. So you do it as well with tetralogy of flow or hypoplastic left heart. And um, if you want to keep this open, you use prostaglandins, PGE1 analogs like mesoprostol and alprostadil. 
So let's go into Tetralogy of Fallot. Um, this one is the most common cyanotic uh, congenital heart disease in children. Um, so it's not the most common in infants. That's the one we're going to talk about um, next, which is the transposition of great vessels. But it's the most common in children. So let's look at how how it works. We have um, this mnemonic P R O V. Um, so you got to prove you have tetralogy of flow. And the way you prove it is you have the pulmonic stenosis, where your pulmonic artery or your pulmonic valve is is too small, it's stenotic. Um, you have right ventricular hypertrophy. You have a uh, overriding aorta, which is the aorta is kind of um, kind of straddling the um, ventricular septum, and you have the ventricular septal defect. So, as you can imagine, with these things going on, um, there are uh, there it, it's a uh, most often a cyanotic condition because you're not getting enough oxygenated blood. So on um, history, it's not always immediately cyanotic, but it often is. And the symptoms uh, present with congestive heart failure. Um, if it's, if, um, it's showing up later in children, then you might notice for, first these little tet spells. And the tet spells are at times when um, times when the, the child is needing more oxygen to the body, and a lot of times you'll see him squatting down to um, make it easier for uh, to reduce the pressure so they can uh, get blood back up into their heart and uh, and create more oxygenation. So on exam, you hear this systolic ejection murmur at the left upper sternal border. So this is because of your pulmonic stenosis, which is one of the main, uh, the main problems that's associated with the symptoms of tetralogy of Fallot is the pulmonic stenosis. So diagnosis, echo, cath, uh, chest x-ray will show kind of this boot shape of the heart. Uh, remember, that's associated with this right ventricular hypertrophy. And um, the treatment, uh, you want to you keep the uh, ductus arterios arteriosus open if you can, um, if there's severe pulmonary stenosis. You give them O2, you give them beta blockers, pressors, fluids, um, and morphine for the TET spells. Um, one thing that you can do um, as a temporary treatment is you can do balloon atrial septostomy. So this can be done, uh, for example, by an interventionalist who goes in um, and creates a a hole basically in the septum, uh, atrial septum, which can provide um, provide a, an additional shunt to allow more oxygenated blood to be circulated. And then, of course, surgical correction is the um, is the big one. So we we mentioned it is associated with uh, maternal phenylketonuria and DiGeorge syndrome. And just as a side note, remember DiGeorge is the catch-22 mnemonic um, where you got these cardiac issues like Tetralogy of Fallot. You get the abnormal facies, the thymic aplasia, the cleft palate, uh, hypocalcemia, and it's, a, and it's caused by a, a 22Q11 deletion. Transposition of great vessels. So let's look at, at a picture of this at first. Oh, I wish I had one. Um, let's pretend that this one is a picture. If you can see the the red artery, which is of course is the aorta number ten here, 
and then um, the blue one, which is number nine, uh, which is the pulmonary artery. And you just unplug number nine and plug it into eight, and then unplug number ten and plug it into seven. So you are switching the spots where um, these arteries come out of their their respective ventricles. So what happens here is you have the um, the blood will be coming in um, to the right heart, and it will be um, pumped out into the aorta um, from the right heart. So it's coming from the periphery where it's unoxygenated, and it's going to come into the right heart and be pumped back out into the periphery. So as you can see, it's not hitting the lungs on its way, and so it's we're basically just pumping it in a circle without getting any oxygenation to it. Whereas the blood that's in the lungs is going to be coming in through the pulmonary veins, and um, and then it's going to be pumped back out into the pulmonary artery from the left ventricle. And so again, we have a separate loop. So we have two separate systems, two separate uh, circulation systems, and uh, the body is not getting oxygenated. So this is the most common cyanotic uh, congenital heart disease in newborns. Um, and as you would imagine, um, it's not compatible with life, and that's why um, you always see this uh, in a newborn. You don't see it with, you know, it doesn't show up later on because nobody could live with two separate circulation systems. It's again associated with DiGeorge, DiGeorge and uh, with diabetic mothers. On history and physical, you notice it immediately because um, they come, babies come out and uh, are immediately uh, unable to get receive oxygen. There's no murmur associated with it, so you're not going to pick it up with your stethoscope. So hopefully, uh, this these ones all get seen um, on the ultrasound beforehand. Um, your diagnosis again is going to be with echo. Um, you get kind of an egg-shaped look to the heart on chest X-ray. You treat it with uh, IV prostaglandin. Uh, mesoprostol or alprostadil, and this will help keep the the uh, patent ductus arteriosus open if it is open. You can go in uh, immediately and do a balloon atrial septostomy um, to uh, make a shunt in order to allow oxygenation, um, or if there is already an atrial septal defect, then you can enlarge it. But uh, uh, I didn't list it here, but the obvious answer is you have to go in and switch these vessels around. Uh, and that surgery can be done. It's pretty unbelievable. You ought to look it up on YouTube uh, because it's an impressive surgery to watch. And, um, coarctation of the aorta is not necessarily a heart defect because it's uh, on the aorta, but it's worth talking about, and it's and it's common enough. So you see the little notch uh, around where the letter A is on the aorta. This is often going to be around the spot where uh, the ductus arteriosus is. And um, so it, it, it kind of comes off that same spot and uh, maybe something with the connective tissue around there or a defect in that connective tissue is what causes this uh, constriction of the aorta. So if you're looking at the picture here, you can imagine that uh, the the three arteries um, that are coming off the aorta first, um, the you got your carotid arteries there and your um, what is that called? Um, your axillary arteries which come off. Um, they are getting blood, uh, but the the arteries that come off below that coarctation are not getting as much blood to them because of the constriction. So this is associated with Turner's, um, 
people who have this also often have berry aneurysms. It's more common in males, uh, and it's often associated with bicuspid aortic valve. On history and physical, they're often asymptomatic. Some of them until uh, later on when they're trying to do sports or things like that. Um, but the lower extremity um, can get uh, some claudication. Sometimes uh, people get bloody noses or uh, fainting, headaches, uh, weak fem femoral pulses, and higher blood pressure in the upper extremities is, of course, expected. And you can hear a murmur on this. It's a short systolic murmur in the left axilla. Diagnose it with uh, echo, chest x-ray. In older people, you can see um, the this uh, rib notching where we've compensated for that constriction by increasing blood flow to uh, the collateral arteries that run along the uh, ribs. So the treatment again, you can use uh, prostaglandins to keep the ductus arteriosus open. Uh, you do you can do surgical correction with balloon angio balloon angioplasty, but you got to watch for that to watch for re restenosis, um, and you've got to be careful uh, not to allow it, the artery to dissect or sometimes there's a possibility of aneurysm. So there's there's quite a few more, obviously, that we didn't go over. Uh, there's congenital uh, uh, valve stenoses, like uh, congenital aortic stenosis. Um, any, of the, any of the valves can be stenotic at birth. Any of the valves can be insufficient at birth, or you get reed gurge. One that's common is uh, mitral valve prolapse. Um, but these are the big ones that you're going to have to find and treat in kids. So I made this chart here that goes over um, the main conditions that we covered, their associations and their murmurs. I especially think it's important to have an idea about these murmurs. So remember, with ventricular septal defect, you get a whole st systolic lower left sternal border murmur. Atrial septal defects, remember that wide fixed split S2. And then you get a systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border. Uh, patent dec dec dectus arteriosus, you get that machinery murmur. You hear it at the second left intercostal space. Tetralogy of flow, you get the systolic ejection murmur at the upper left sternal border and the transposition of uh, great arteries, uh, great vessels, you don't hear any murmur. Coarctation, you get that murmur in the left axilla. Um, you may be tested on these, uh, these associations as well. In my opinion, that's uh, not as important for, certainly for a, a primary care to remember uh, that VSD is associated with Aperts, Downs, uh, Fetal Alcohol, Torch, Crowded Chat, Trisomy 13, 18. But what I think is important to remember is that all of these are associated with, um, with heart defects. So if you see um, any of these any of these uh, conditions, then you got to make sure you are screening for uh, heart defects as well. All right, special thanks to um, this uh, guy from Azerbaijan, whose name I can't pronounce, who made the uh, Eisenmangers chart, and for uh, somebody who calls themselves uh, Lady of Hats, who provided the picture of Tetralogy of Flow. Other pictures were in the public domain. If you want to volunteer, please comment on the videos. It's very helpful to have comments so we can make the videos more efficient and, uh, and more correct. And it, there's lots of ways that we could use volunteer work. If you want to vo volunteer, uh, go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer. Thank you.